Hi guys. In this chapter, chapter 11, we're going to study about the business cycle and we study the economic fluctuation. So first, we're going to study the stylized facts about the business cycle and then we're going to distinguish the short run and the long run and how we determine the short run and the long run in macroeconomics. And after that, we're going to introduce uh, the aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And after that, we're going to study about the supply side and demand side together. And we put it together, we're going to have the AD, AS model. So by using this ADAS model, we can study about the short run and long run effects of the shocks. And we're going to talk about the details later. So the first one, this is a fact about the business cycle. So GDP grows average 3% per year over the long run. So that's for the US or the advanced country. For some developing country, they can achieve the more than 5%. Or the China, for example, they can achieve those 8%, 9% per year. Okay? But there is a large fluctuation in the short run. That means that there is up and down. So up means that they face the economic boom. Down means that they face the economic recession. Okay? And the second one, the consumption and investment fluctuate with the GDP. The consumption tends to be less volatile and investments much more volatile than the GDP. So I want you to recall the equation, Y equals uh, consumption plus investment plus government spending. And this is an aggregate demand equation, okay? So of course that when you have the fluctuation on the right-hand side, automatically the left-hand side has to be fluctuated. So that's what that means. So right-hand side, when the consumption and investment, they are volatile, then of course the left-hand side, the aggregate demand. And in this case, the GDP volatile, the fluctuation, right? But it turns out consumption is a much less volatile than investment. Why is that? There is a certain amount of money that you need to spend to survive. On the other hand, the investment is very sensitive to economic situation. So when you face a recession, the investors, the companies, the CEOs, they decide to stop, you know, invest or start to uh, stop expanding their business or they hand their investment plan. Okay? On the other hand, the consumption. Again, there's a certain amount of the money that you need to survive, spend to survive. So that's why, regardless of the economic situation, the consumption is not that volatile. On the other hand, the investment is very sensitive to economic situation. And then the third one, unemployment rises during recessions and falls during expansion. That's natural. So when you face a recession, you don't need to produce that much because people don't buy it. That means that you don't produce less, so, uh, sorry, you produce less, that means that you don't have, you don't need to have the lots of the workers, right? So then you fire some of them, okay? So that's why when you face a recession, unemployment rises, okay? But when you go back, when you recover from the recession, you need to have the more workers. That's why the unemployment falls during expansions or the recovery of the recessions, okay? Alcon's law is the inverse relationship between the GDP and unemployment. Again, I want you to recall the chapter three. So we have this equation, the supply side of the output, Y equals the F of K and L. And as you know, when you have uh, less workers, then the output goes down, right? That means unemployment goes up. That means output goes down. Right? So you have a less worker, that means the unemployment is increased. In the case, output goes down. That's the Auckland's law. All right, so this is data. Uh, gross rate of the real GDP and consumption, but here there's a typo. We don't have the consumption data. This is just real GDP gross rate. And as you can see, it's a, you can see the fluctuation. So for example, this is a COVID-19 and here's a financial crisis. So when we face a recession, as you can see, the real GDP could be negative, right? So here is around the negative 5% and the COVID-19 is around the negative 9%, okay? But after that, it takes some time, but we uh, could achieve the recovered, uh, recovery from the crisis, okay? And here you can compare the GDP consumption and investment. As you can see here, the green one is an investment and the standard deviation is a, a lot you know, larger than the consumption and the real GDP. That means that it's a fluctuate 
a lot more than the consumption and investment, as consumption and the real GDP. On the other hand, the consumption is a relatively stable compared with the investment. And here's our unemployment data and financial crisis, COVID-19 unemployment uh, is increased because it, we produce less, that means that we need to have the less workers. So that's why the companies fire some workers. Okay. And then here's our current law with the data. And as you can see, the correlation is negative 0.81. That means that unemployment rate goes up, then the person change in real GDP goes down. So you have the loss of the unemployed workers, then your output goes down. Now, we want to understand how we distinguish the long run and short run. So in the long run, prices are flexible. That means that you can update the price if you want. On the other hand, in the short run, prices are sticky. That means that we cannot change the price. Okay? So that's how we distinguish short run and long run. In micro, on the other hand, in micro, economics. When you have variable inputs and fixed inputs, we call it that's a show none. On the, on the other hand, when you have the only variable inputs, That's the long run. So that being said, in the long run, you can change everything. The number of the workers, the amount of the capital. But on the other hand, in the short run, there is a fixed input that you cannot change. So for example, the number of the machines or the number of the tools or the buildings, these kind of things is difficult to change in the short run, right? So for example, you can hire someone today and you can lay off someone tomorrow, but it's not that easy to change the number of the machines. So you have the aspirin machine today, but you cannot sell it tomorrow, right? It takes some time. Or you are running the business like such as FedEx and you need to have the more trucks, then it takes some time to buy more uh, trucks, right? But anyway, in the long run, prices are flexible. In the long run, prices are sticky. So the reason that we need to distinguish the price behavior is the economy based much differently when prices are sticky. Okay? So that's why we need to distinguish the short run horizon and the long run horizon. All right, so this is uh, the, what we studied before in order to understand the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. So we need to go back to the chapter three. So in chapter three, we study about the supply side of the output, which can be represented with this equation. Y equals F of K and L. So K is a capital, L is a labor, and F is a production function. And the famous production function that we can use is a Cobb Douglas production function, which can be written as A, the technological level, times K to the power of alpha, capital share, L to the power of one minus alpha, okay? So of course, as you know, you have the more capital output is increased. You have the more workers, then you can produce more. Right, And also it is affected by the technological level. So when you compare the developing country with the advanced country, their A's are different. So advanced country A is a large, the uh, developing country, their A is a small. And then we also study about the demand side of the output, which is a Y equals a C plus I plus G. One step further, the consumption is an MPC, marginal propensity to consume times or disposable income, which is a Y minus T, plus investment, and investment is a function of the real interest rate, and we have a government spending G, okay? So the first equation is a supply side of the output, and then the second equation, this is a demand the side of the output, okay? And here, when we study this supply and demand side of the output, we assume that the prices are flexible, okay? So that's why it goes to the long run only because in, this short, in the short run, prices are sticky. So let's take a look at when prices are sticky, output and employment also depends on the demand, which is affected by the fiscal policy, monetary policy, and other factors. 
So when prices are sticky in the short run, government and the central bank, they have an incentive to intervene in the market to mitigate the recession or to stabilize a price level. Okay? Because in the short run, the output and employment depends on the demand. So that being said, fiscal policy and monetary policy that stimulate demand side or that suppress the demand side. So it is very important. Government and central bank in general, they cannot touch the supply side, but they can touch the demand side. Okay. So we're gonna study the role of the government and the central bank when we face a recession or when we face economic boom. All right, so let's move on. So this is a main thing of this chapter 11, the model of the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. So we call it the ADAS model. So basically it captures the relationship between the price level and the aggregate output. So that being said, we're gonna use a graph. So the Y axis is the price level P and the X axis is the output Y, or you can call it the real GDP. So that means that we need to have the demand curve and the supply curve, right? And I want you to recall how you study about the demand curve when you cover the specific good or service, right? So when you study the microeconomics, so here is a price of a good. So Yx is the price of a good. And then the horizontal axis is a quantity of a good or service, right? And you had downward sloping demand curve. So why is it downward sloping? Well, because of the low of demand, okay? When price is high, quantity demand is low. So like this, when price is high, quantity demand is low like this, but when the price is low, quantity demand is high, like point B, okay? So point A, price is high, quantity demand is low. Point B, price is low, the quantity demand is high. That's a low of demand, right? But now, when we study the ADS model, we want to know that how it looks like, the aggregate demand curve. Well, since we studied the, uh, the quantity equation, which we studied in chapter 10, so this one, oh, sorry, the, it was a chapter four. So MV equals PY, that's the quantity equation. And you can rewrite down as following. So M over P equals one over V times Y. And from there, you can capture the inverse relationship between the price and the output. When you assume M and V are not changed, right? So M is a fixed, velocity is fixed. Then when the price goes up, output has to be decreased to hold this equality. Right? And from there, you can have the, so I, as I said, we have the inverse relationship between the price and output. Then we can have downward sloping aggregate demand curve like this. So we have downward sloping aggregate demand curve by using the quantity equation. And there is another way to have this downward sloping aggregate demand curve when we study uh, the IS data model, which covered in chapter 13, okay? So let me cover that one later. But at this point, we can have the downward sloping aggregate demand curve by using the quantity equation. It's a different story with the low demand, okay? Now, here, after we have this downward sloping aggregate demand curve, what we want to know is that when do we need to shift this one aggregate demand curve to the left or right, okay? So it says, there is an increase in price level causes foreign real money balances, M over P, causing a decrease in the money, de decrease in the demand for goods and service, okay? So that being said, it captures the inverse relationship between the price and output. Now, let me write down the quantity equation one more time, M V equals P Y. So M over P equals one over V times Y. Now, what if, what if M is increased, then what happened? So if the M is increased, then in order to hold this equality, output, the right-hand side, the Y has to be equal, uh, increased, right? So that being said, if, central bank put more money into the market, then output is increased. So the aggregate demand curve shift to the right. Or if the central bank, they reduce the money supply like this, then the output has to be decreased to hold this equality. In the case, aggregate demand curve shift to the right, left. Okay. All right, so let's move on. 
So a reduction in the money supply should be segregate demand curve to the left, a increase in the money supply should be segregate demand curve to the right, okay? And also, I want you to recall this aggregate demand curve captures this equation y equals c plus i plus g. Or you can write down mpc times y minus t plus i plus i. The investment is a function of the real interest rate plus government spending. Okay. So then you can get to know if something is changed on the right hand side then this aggregate demand curve shift to the left or shift to the right. For example, if the government spends more, so the G is increased, then do we need to shift this aggregate demand curve to the left or right? So if government spends more, they're spending, then the output, this aggregate demand curve, aggre sorry, the aggregate demand, this Y is an increase, right? In the case, we have to shift this aggregate demand curve to the right, okay? And we're gonna cover more example in the following. All right, now let's talk about the supply side. So we cover the supply of the output equation, y equals f of k and l. The reason that we picked, uh, put the bar is the following, because in the long run, we have the fixed number of the workers and the capital is a fixed and the production function is not changed over time. So everything is fixed. That's why the left-hand side is also fixed. And this Y bar, we call it the full employment or the natural level of the output, or you can call it the potential GDP, okay? So that captures uh, when you are using the full resources, right? And it doesn't necessarily say that the full employment equals the, uh, you know, natural, uh, the in unemployment rate equals zero. So that means that full employment, even though you have the full employment, the unemployment rate is not equals zero. It could be 2%, 3%, something like that. Okay. So for example, other parts of the country, uh, they have a really good welfare system. Then the natural rate of the unemployment is uh, like very high okay? because at some people, they don't need to work and they get subsidized from the government. All right, so then we can have the body for long run aggregate supply curve. So in the long run, you are using the full resources and we have the Y equals F of K and L and we have the fixed L, fixed capital and the fixed technology. So then we have the fixed output Y bar. So it does not depend on the price level. That's why the, in the long run, long run aggregate supply curve is a body okay? On the other hand, short run aggregate supply curve like this, which is horizontal. Why is that? Because in the short run, prices are sticky. So the price level is a fixed at a predetermined level P bar here. So that's why we have the horizontal short run aggregate supply curve, okay? Now, before we move on, let's go to the, go back to the long run aggregate supply curve and the short run aggregate supply curve and aggregate demand curve, put it together. So then we have this equilibrium, okay? Now, Let's take a look at the long run effects of the decrease in money supply. So again, when central bank reduces the money supply, then this aggregate demand curve shift to the left, okay? So AD curve, we divide it by using the MV equals PY, the quantity equation, and you can write down as M over P equals one over V times Y. So when the central bank reduces the money supply, the output has to be decreased. But here, basically we need to assume that the price and the balance is, they are not changed, right? Then when M goes down, the right-hand side, the Y has to be decreased. That's why when the central bank reduces the money supply, this AD curve shift to the left. As a result to what happened in the long run, well, price level is a decrease. So that means that you face the deflation, but the output stays the same. So in the long run, when the central bank implement the contraction in monetary policy. They lower the money supply, they reduce the money supply, then this AD curve shift to the left. As a result, price level will be decreased, but output stays the same. And then here, what's the shown on effects of the decrease in money supply? The same situation. When the central bank reduces the money supply, AD curve shifts to the left, but now what do you see? 
price level is a fixed at predetermined level, the P bar, but then the output is decreased. So what do you see? So when central bank implement the contract market policy, we face the lower output. Okay? So that means that it explains the short term fluctuation. Or you can say that the government and the central bank, they intervene in the market, they can adjust the output, like we studied here. So take a look. This one one more time. Here, when prices are sticky in the short run, output and employment also depends on the demand, which is affected by fiscal policy, monetary policy, and other factors. So in our example here, when the central bank implement the contraction monetary policy, they reduce the money supply curve. Sorry, they reduce the money supply, then this AD curve to the left, and then we face the lower output. Oh, by the way, you may ask me, uh, is there another way to interpret this AD curve shift to the left when the central bank implement contraction by contraction and multi policy? Yes. So again, the AD curve can be captured with this equation Y equals to C plus I plus G and C is a consumption, MPC times a Y minus T, disposable income and investment is a function of the interest rate and we have the government spending. Now you probably recall the money market graph. So let me draw it here. So the money market graph is the following. So let me use a simple, the nominal interest rate, I on the Y axis and the X axis, the quantity of the money. And then we have downward sloping money demand curve, okay? So when interest rate is high, you don't want to hold the cash. When the interest rate is low, well, you have an incentive to hold more cash. Because when interest rate is high, the, the interest rate is an opportunity cost of the holding money. So you want to put that money into the saving account to get interest. Now, the money supply is a vertical because it's controlled by the central bank. If central bank implement contraction and monetary policy, then what happened? This money supply curve shift to the left like this. Okay? Then what happened? Interest rate was I1, but now you have a higher interest rate I2. So when the nominal interest rate goes up, in the short term prices are sticky, then by using the Fisher equation, you get to know the real interest rate is also increased. Then what happened? Investment goes down. Then the output goes down. So that means that AD curve has to be shipped to the left when central bank implement the contraction market policy. Okay? And I want you to recall the Fisher equation. So Fisher equation captures the relationship between the interest rate, nominal interest rate and the real interest rate. And nominal interest rate, the real interest rate equals a nominal interest rate minus inflation rate, or that you can write down the nominal interest rate equals a real interest rate plus inflation. But in the short run, prices are sticky, then the nominal interest rate is increased and the real interest rate has to be increased too, okay? All right. And then here, we want to know the transition from the short run to the long run. So in the short run, uh, your short run output is greater than the long run level of the output or the potential GDP, then we call it the inflationary gap. And your current output, the short run output is less than the long run level of the output that we call it the recessionary gap. But then it says, when you have the inflationary gap, the price over time is an increase. And when you have the recessionary gap, the price over time is decreased. So let me give you the logic here. So here, let me draw the inflationary gap first. So here's the price level Y axis and the output on the X axis. And you have the downward sloping aggregate demand curve and you have vertical long run aggregate supply curve and you have the horizontal short run aggregate supply curve. And as you can see here, the short run output is here. So let me call it the equilibrium point A. Your current output, Y, the short run output is Y is greater than Y bar. And we call it this gap is an inflationary gap. Why do we call it inflationary gap? Well, what happened is over time, this short run aggregate supply curve shift to the above like this. Why? Well, the reason is following. 
when you have the output, which is greater than the long run level of the output, so that means that you have the loss of the workers, right? In order to produce more, you need to have the lot, a lot, a number of the workers. In order to keep this worker over time, you need to pay more, okay? So Y is a large, that means that you probably have the loss of the workers. And in order to keep these workers, you need to pay more. So wage over time will be increased. When the wage is increased, the cost of the production is increased, right? So just imagine that you sell a cup of coffees and you used to sell the price of the coffee is a $5. And in order to make a cup of coffee, it cost $1, right? But when you pay more your workers, the cost will be increased, like from the $1 to $2. Then can you keep the $5? Well, you need to raise the price to $6 something, right? So when the cost of the production is increased, then the price will be increased. So here the price means the price of the, your output. So that's why the over time, this shown on aggregate supply curve shift to the above, then you're gonna have the uh, higher price level P2, okay? So that's the transition from the shown on equilibrium to the long run equilibrium and you have the equilibrium point P. So one more time, your current output, the shown on output is greater than long run level of the output. That means that you have the, a lot of the workers to produce this amount. That means that in order to keep these workers, you need to pay more. When you pay more, the cost of the production is increased, then you have to raise the price in the end. So that's why the shown on aggregate supply curve should to the above. Now, let me explain the recessionary gap. It's the opposite. So here, same graph. So here's a P bar. Now you can see that your current output, the shonen output Y is less than the Y bar, right? What does that mean? Since you are producing less, that means that the workers, the number of workers is a small, right? That means that there are a lot of people who wanna get a job. Then these workers, they are willing to take less wages. So let's say that you, we have the minimum wage, which is a $15 per hour. But there are people, they want to get a job even if they get paid like a $14 per hour, $13 per hour, okay? So in that case, what happened? This is totally a positive. So wage will be decreased and the cost of the production goes down, then the price can be decreased like this. So this is a one way to explain from the short run, short run to the long run, the transition, when you have the inflationary gap here and when you have the recessionary gap here, okay? Again, let's go back to here. The adjustment of the prices is what is what moves the economy to is a long run equilibrium from the short run equilibrium, okay? All right, so let's move on. So here, Let's say that there is a fall in aggregate demand for some reasons, okay? Then what happened? We had a horizontal equilibrium point A, but when there is a fall in aggregate demand the curve, oh, sorry, where, when there is a fall in aggregate demand, so that means that we need to shift this aggregate demand curve to the left, then as a result, we have the shown on equilibrium, the output, which is less than the uh, Y bar, right? So here's a Y and the Y bar, and when you compare, the Y is less than the Y bar, right? But then over time, we have the transition from the short run equilibrium B to the long run equilibrium C. What happened? Over time, this short run aggregate supply curve shift to the downward like this, like this, okay? And th that is short run equilibrium supply curve. You can call it short run aggregate supply curve two, okay? So then the price would be decreased. So what do you see? Well, when you have the negative demand shock, so that shift this AD curve to the left. Then in the short run, you have the less output, but prices are the same. But in the long run, price will be decreased, but then the output goes back to the original level, the Y bar, okay? So 
So basically, I can summarize here. So the, the first column is a short run and the second column is a long run. And we want to see that what happened to the price level, what happened to the output when you have the negative demand shock. So when you have the negative demand shock, that means that AD curve shift to the left, then what happened? In the short run, as you can see, prices stays the same, right? In the short run, prices are skip. But output, output goes down. But in the long run, what happened? Price goes down, output goes back to the original level, white bar, okay? So you can make a table like this. But I want you to draw the graph to understand what's going on. Without having graph, it's so difficult to uh, find the answers, okay? So you should draw the graph to uh, figure it out what happened to the price level, what happened to the output. All right, so let's go deeper. I mentioned that that is a negative demand shock. So we're gonna study about uh, more shocks. So the shocks are the exogenous changes in aggregate supply or demand. So that means that aggregate supply curve shift to the left or shift to the right, that's the shocks. And demand the curve shift to the left and shift to the right, that's the demand the shocks. Okay? So when we have a shocks, uh, it pushed the economy away from the equilibrium or the full employment. Okay? For example, uh, what happened? when there is exogenous decrease in velocity. Well, you can use a quantity equation M equals PY. So that is same as M over P equals one over V times Y. So assume that the money supply is held constant. So you can put the bar here and the velocity is not changed over time. Sorry, the, in the short term prices are sticky. Then what happened? When there is a decrease in velocity here, the whole thing, the one over V goes up, right? And in order to hold this equality, the output has to be decreased. That means exogenous decrease in velocity is actually the negative demand shock. Okay. Because it affects the demand equation. Okay. And then here, the effects of the policy demand shock. So for example, you have a bright future. So that's why you decide to invest more, you consume more, things like that. Then this aggregate demand the curve shift to the right. What happened in the show none, output is increased, right? But over time, since you have the inflationary gap, the show none aggregate supply curve shift to the above, then you have the long run equilibrium point C. So that means that in the show none, output is increased, uh, prices stays the same, but in the long run, we face inflation, but output goes back to the original level, the white bar. Now let's talk about the supply shocks. So we can have the negative supply shock, or you can call it the adverse supply shock, or we can have the positive, the favorable supply shocks. So negative supply shocks, bad weather with crop yields, pushing up food prices, or the oil shocks, oil cartel lays the price of the oil. So for example, the war between the Ukraine and the Russia, that's a negative supply shock, okay? All right, so here is a case study. You can take a look. Well, the question is following. When the oil price is increased, do we need to shift this long non aggregate supply curve or the short non aggregate supply curve? So we actually need to shift this short non aggregate supply curve because when price goes up of the gasoline, then the price of the cost, sorry, the cost of the production is increased. That means the short non aggregate supply curve has to be increased to capture the increase of the price. Okay? So oil price is increased. That means the cost of the production is increased and uh, the companies, they need to charge you more. Okay, so that's why the short run aggregate supply curve shift to the above like this. Oil price shock happens. So then the short run aggregate supply curve was a SRSA at short run AS1, but then it shifted to the above short run aggregate supply curve Q. But then over time, it goes back to the original level. Why is that? Because you face recessionary gap, right? So over time, the short run aggregate supply curve shift to the downward. Again, even though the oil price is increased, you face the recessionary gap, then you can lower the wages, right? So oil price, oil price is increased, but then over time, because you face a recessionary gap, 
you can lower the wage, right? So then they can cancel out. So in order to produce something, you need to have the oil, you need to have the workers, but oil price is increased, but then the wage is increase, uh, decreased, they cancel out. So then short non aggregate supply curve shift to the down. So this is a detail. So when there is an oil price shock, then the short non aggregate supply curve shift to the above. So we have the short non equilibrium point B. Then what do you see? Price is increased, price is increased, but then the output is decreased, right? And we call it the stagflation. So when you face inflation, but output decreased too, then we call it the stagflation, right? But if the government and the central bank, they don't do anything, then it will be adjusted by itself because if we face a recessionary gap, the short non aggregate supply curve shift to the downward like this. Okay. Okay, you can read this part by yourself. All right, now this is the last part of this chapter 11, stabilization policy. So when you see the output is decreased or the increase, government and the central bank, they want to stabilize the economic situation. They want to uh, minimize the strong non economic fluctuation. So, for example, central bank, they implement a monetary policy to combat the effects of the other bird supply shocks. So, let's take a look. Here, it's a little bit difficult to understand with this graph. So, let me uh, draw, he draw it here. Okay. I'm going to show you the step by step. So, the y axis is the price level, x axis is the output, or the real GDP. We have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. We have the horizontal short non aggregate supply curve, and we have the vertical long non aggregate supply curve. Okay. This, is, this gives us the original equilibrium point A. So here's a P bar, and this is a Y bar. Now, let's say that we have a negative supply shock. So that shift is short non aggregate supply curve to the above, like this SRAS2. So then we face a short non equilibrium point B. So, and the price level increase, and then the output is decreased, right? That's a stagflation. But governments, they don't want to have the lower output. They want to go back to this level of the output. Then they have an incentive to, in, uh, to implement expansionary fiscal policy or the expansion monetary policy. But here, uh, let's use the monetary policy. Central bank, they put more money into the market and they lower the inter uh, interest rate. And as a result, the investment is increased. Then what happened? This aggregate demand curve shift to the right. So when the central bank implement expansionary monetary policy, then the AD curve shift to the right. Okay. So pretty simply, expansionary monetary policy shift this AD curve to the right. Contractionary monetary policy shift this AD curve to the left. Okay. But given this situation, they want to mitigate the recession. They want to go back to this original level of the output Y bar. They implement expansionary monetary policy, this AD curve shift to the right. Then as a result, we can achieve the new equilibrium point C. But then what happened? Well, we face higher price level P2 as a result. When the central bank, they don't intervene in the market and they just wait, then what happened? This run non aggregate supply curve shift to the downward to the original level, right? But it takes some time and we don't know how long does it take. So that's why central bank, they want to go back to this original level of the y output Y bar where they mitigate the recession. Then they implement the expansion monetary policy, shift this AD curve to the right. They, they go back to this original level of the output Y bar. But as a result, we have the higher price level. There's a cause of this expansion monetary policy. So you cannot catch two birds with one stone. So they can achieve the uh, mitigation of the output, but then they face inflation. Okay. So that's what this graph explains. So I believe that now you can go uh, take a look by yourself. So I give you the detailed uh, steps. And that's basically the chapter 11. So let me stop here and see you guys next.